go. Good morning, America. Good morning, world. I want to thank you to an MS Views and News annual MS Symposium. We have been doing this now. Well, today is our 12th annual MS Symposium. Okay, and, um, you know, we do this every year. We have been doing it live in person until 2020 when we had to turn it into a virtual program. So this also is virtual. Fortunately, we had over 500 people registered to, to be on today's program. So I want to thank everybody that has registered. Okay, for those that do not know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I am an MS patient. I'm also president and founder of MS Views and News. This was put together in 2008 when we began, and we did it so that way we can educate those affected by multiple sclerosis. So today, we have sponsors. You could see the wall behind me. We have Bristol Myers Squibb. We have Santa Fe Genzyme, Genentech, Novartis, TG Therapeutics, Biogen, and Malincrot. And I do want to thank all of them, and I hope that all of you can thank them as well so that way we can do today's program. Today's presenters, we have Trisha Pagnata. She's a nurse practitioner from Central Florida. I will tell you about her in a moment. We also have Gretchen Hawley. Gretchen Hawley is a, she's a doctor of physical therapy. She will be on to discuss the exercise and, and movement. Okay, and then again, we unfortunately do not have Dr. Mary Hughes, but Dr. Boster will be doing both her presentation and his presentation. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So I don't want to hold you all up. I want to get started because we do have a tremendous amount of, of, of what it is to be presented as well as all these questions to be had. So let me introduce Trisha Pagnata. She is a nurse practitioner. She's with the MS Center of Greater Orlando, which is in Maitland, Florida. And we're just going to get started on this right now. Trisha, please take it away. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad that everybody's able to attend. We're going to move through my slides very quickly, so we'll move on. So first, I think we needed to set the stage with what is MS. And what I want persons to understand most is that this is a chronic lifelong disease. We do not have a cure. This is caused by the inflammation um, and degeneration of myelin. Next. So as you see a healthy nerve cell here, you see the communication. The lines really go through the myelin that is the axon from one neuron to another. Next. And as we start to see inflammation, you can see this myelin starts getting interrupted. The signal gets interrupted. It's eaten away at. And that then reduces the um, spread to the next neuron. When you get degeneration, you actually get permanent damage, which is a breakage of that neuron. And so no communication. Next. And we're going to build this slide, but the key here I wanted everyone to be able to see is that uh, you want to treat early. Whenever someone is diagnosed, our goal of therapy is to treat persons early. So I just wanted persons to have a frame of reference here. We need to treat early. Next. So I, I just wanted to review the common symptoms of MS. And in case you weren't aware of what has happened to you or could happen to you, here are some of the common symptoms. We'll move forward. And here is um, the presentation that I'm beginning it with. What is a relapse? And so persons, um, it's important that you can identify this for your healthcare provider. Um, so if we go to what a relapse is, it's new or worsening symptoms that last for more than 24 hours are not associated with anything else, no other illnesses, no um, change in your activity, no um, new medications. And so this is a very comprehensive symptom checklist for you to look at to be able to tell your healthcare provider, have you had a new or worsening symptom that's 24 or 48 hours long? Has it um, been present getting worse? Is it pain? Is it difficulty with either speech or swallowing? Are you having vertigo that is constant with or without nausea? Are you having any bowel or bladder changes, difficulty with um, voiding or incontinence? Have you had difficulty with doing self-care? Have you had any marked changes in your vision, mobility, cognition, falling, change in your mood, 
a worsening alteration in sensation or function or worsening fatigue. So any of these things should be things you should report to your healthcare provider. Next. So when we look at relapses, they're very scary, very frightening for persons because most persons are on therapy when they're talking to their health care provider about a relapse. And so then they're worried about, oh my gosh, is my therapy not working? When we look at treating a relapse, it's important to, that we're looking at what a person's previous relapse treatment was, what treatment they're currently on for modifying their disease, but what have they used in the past and how severe is the attack? Next. So I'm gonna run through the typical um, therapies. First is steroids, and steroids come in methylprednisone, prednisone, dextamethasone, and medrol. Um, the, the mode of action of this is to reduce inflammation that's occurring in your central nervous system. It can get, be given intravenously or oral. The common side effects, nausea, um, anxiety, um, nervousness, GI upset, increased appetite, facial flushing and urinary frequency. Most of this can be managed with stomach um, aid reducers and sleep aid reducers. Next. Afgar gel is a hormone that causes your body to generate its own natural steroids. It also binds to five melanocortin peptide receptors in your body that we know have other effects on your immune system that affect both the macrophages, cytokines that are being released, help regulate T um, cells and B cells. This is a self-administered medication, so you can give it intramuscularly or subcutaneous it carries the same side effects as steroids because it causes your body to make its own steroids and the same um, side effect management. Next. When we look at IVIG, this is giving persons a, uh, a IV infusion of a ton of antibodies. And so these are thousands of persons have donate their plasma and we have taken super concentrated antibodies out of that. It is administered IV, although in certain diseases that has been administered subcutaneously, but for our MS, we don't. Side effects, headaches, nausea, dizziness. You can have infusion reactions. If, if you didn't have your IgA level checked, that's important to note because the deficiency can cause a severe allergic reaction. There's potential for blood clotting, renal failure, and aseptic meningitis or infections. And so really the management of this is pre-medication and minimize, to minimize infusion reactions and also the length, the length of time it's being infused. Next. Plasmapheresis is actually a um, dialysis type of, um, where you're, you get a central line put in and your blood is taken out, runs through a machine, and it washes out your antibodies. So it washes out that which is um, causing the inflammation to occur. So persons with this can have faintness, blurring vision, a feeling of cold, stomach cramps, infection, blood clottings, and of course you can be allergic. The management of this is typically with fluids and um, rate of um, dialysis. So important to note that plasmapheresis is only done in a hospital setting unless a person is chronic and that's not in MS. Plas um, IVIG can be given in a hospital, it can be given in a home, and it can also be given in some clinics. Here, what I wanted you to get an impression of is Stuart always gives me symptoms, and I can't talk about all of the symptoms. So I want you to know that the symptoms I've chosen to talk to you about today were um, part of what Stuart wanted me to, um, and you've asked for, but everything is dependent on another. So if you have one symptom and you're not managing that, that's going to make another symptom worse. So everything is connected. I wanted you to get a feel for that. So it's extremely important that you you treat any symptom you have because it will impair something else. Next. Symptom management is 
important to think about the fact that it's a comprehensive. Um, and so because most symptoms are reported as chronic, I wanted you to know that this, again, is something that can happen to you maybe during a relapse or in a period of time that is worse, but it can be something that's chronic. So it's important that you think very holistically. Next. Pain is one of the common symptoms of multiple sclerosis. 65% of persons report pain. Um, reasons for this can be from the inflammation or demyelination of the sensory nerve tracts, spasticity, alterations in the way you're moving because of weakness and other comorbidities. Move on. And so again, looking globally at pain management, um, it's important to think about not only are we using medications, we're using maybe dietary supplements and orthotics and um, referrals to a wide variety of individuals. Next. When we look at specific types of pain, neuropathy is a type of pain that can be described as a burning, tingling, itching, prickling, buzzing type of vibrations in your extremities. It can be in your trunk. Um, we typically use neuropathic pain medications for this, and so you he see some of them. Other anti-seizure medications can be used. And narcotics, we find, are least effective in this type of pain. Next. When we're looking at spasticity, this is a stiffness, a muscle spasm, rigidity, inability to bend. Um, this is managed with antispastic medications like baclofen, Xanaflex, Valium, other muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine might be used. Um, complementary medicine is imperative for the successful management of this, and that includes physical therapy, stretching, yoga, tai chi and more. Next. When we look at another type of pain, the Lermitz phenomena, this is that electrical shock you get when you bend your neck forward and you have pain that just um, sears through your body. Um, for some people that can be rather um, constant, other people it happens just very sporadically. So depending upon how it is for you is what the pain um, plan would be. Again, medications, physical therapy for neck and back pains, move on. When we look at trigeminal neuralgia, this is a facial pain that can um, be very excruciating. In persons, um, they have de defined this as one of the higher rates for suicide is trigeminal neuralgia pain because it's a very severe, searing, shocking type of pain in the face um, and happens repetitively um, even without stimulation, but with stimulation of your face can be very um, severe. We use seizure medications um, most frequently for this um, and antispasmodic medications. There are surgical options, a decompression can be done or even radiation. Next. I wanted to touch on what everyone will ask me about, which is cannabis and MS. And, and there's two major cannabinoids that have been studied. One is THC, which is thought to be the psychoactive substance in um, cannabis. And this is what alters, changes brain functions, alters person's perception, mood, consciousness. Um, and the concentration of THC in cannabis can vary anywhere from one up to 24%. CBD is a cannabinoid that is the major non-psychoactive cannabinoid found in cannabis. And this concentration also can vary, um, but typically is not as high as concentrations um, and typically um, is um, much, much lower. Next. So I'm going to talk mostly about can, uh, CBD because this is something that you can get in 7-Eleven, you can get everywhere. So this is thought to change the receptors in your CNS, how they respond to pain. This can be oral, it can be topical, it can be inhaled. There are side effects that have been well reported, dry mouth, diarrhea, dizziness, low blood pressure, dizziness. Um, drowsiness, decreased uh, appetite, and there have been some liver um, issues associated with this. Move on. I wanted to give you a guideline that is what we use now. The American Academy of Neurology put out a guideline in 2014, and it was reaffirmed in 2020. 
And what they say is that through looking at a meta-analysis of all the studies, they have found that patient reported outcomes with oral cannabis um, and synthetic TAC, THC has been um, reported improvement in spasticity and pain, not in tremor um, and not in measures that healthcare providers measure. Also, the pharmaceutical GW um, puts together Stevex, and that probably is also patient reports effectiveness in spasticity, pain, and urinary frequency, but not in bladder incontinence, again, not in tremor, and not in spasticity that we as healthcare providers can measure. Smoked cannabis research studies have not produced enough evidence to assess its safety or effectiveness in treating MS patients, including spasticity and pain. So the guide as we um, talk to individuals is that everything is a risk benefit. And so through these meta-analysis, it's important to know that these products are not standardized or supervised by the FDA. And so therefore the quality, purity, and specific ingredients have not been um, regulated. So that's something to keep in mind. The use of cannabis, um, which as a therapy has both um, potential benefits can also have potential side effects. So it's very important that persons um, do their own um, test and are very aware of what side effects could potentially occur and talk to your healthcare providers about those. So when we look at fatigue, fatigue is a, a, a subjective lack of physical or mental energy that's perceived by the individual or the caretaker that interferes with usual activities. Move on. It usually, um, MS fatigue can be described as having a rapid onset, impairing social function, interferes with executive responsibilities, your thinking process worsened by heat, and can persist over time. Next. Again, it's a very common symptom. It can happen up to two years prior to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and up to 90% of persons will experience some fatigue. 66% say it's a daily event. 60% um, say it could be their worst symptom. 90% um, say, again, it's worsened by heat, but I would tell you that also people in cold climates say it's worsened by cold. Um, it's cited as the number one reason for people leaving the workforce. Move on. So fatigue and its potential causes, we know it's a, a part primary of MS, but other things can impact fatigue. So it's very important that you, again, look at fatigue very holistically, be open with your healthcare provider to talk about um, other things. Move on. So again, MS causes a fatigue. We know that the immune and neuroendocrine factors play a causative role in the development of fatigue. We know the dysfunction of circuits involving the uh, thalamus, the um, basal ganglia and frontal cortex affected by MS um, or the products of the inflammation can cause fatigue. And we know that this is more associated with um, disability in a variety of disease types move forward. And so again, causes of fatigue, we have the primary fatigue, which is the lassitude, the overwhelming feeling of fatigue, um, tiredness that is not attributed to anything else. And then secondary fatigue in MS is that that can be attributed by something else, maybe the short circuiting type of fatigue, deconditioning or pain, move on. Again, fatigue can be both acute and chronic. Um, something that is less than six weeks is acute, and that's more um, associated with a new lesion or relapse. And chronic is that that's been um, present for more than 50% of the days for more than six weeks. Move on. So comorbid conditions, things like infections, anemia, um, hypo or hyperthyroidism, when we know is very common in MS, cardiovascular diseases and pulmonary diseases can impact fatigue. Move on. Iatrogenic things that just occur, 
So we know many of the disease modifying therapy, especially in the first three months, can be attributed with fatigue. Analgesics, um, most medications that we treat symptoms with, the anticonvulsants, antihistamines, antihypertensives for cardiac disease can cause fatigue, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, muscle relaxant, and diabetic agents. Next. So causes of fatigue, again, sleep disorders, things that keep you awake at night, um, bowel bladder issues, restless legs, spasticity, or, or not actually having good sleep, like sleep apnea. Move on. Physiologic health, like stress, coping, um, anxiety, depression can cause fatigue. Move on. And environmental factors such as the weather, hot, cold, um, consumption of hot liquids. Um, studies suggest that lower educational levels, um, persons have a higher risk of fatigue, so um, keep learning. Studies divided um, are divided on whether there's an age association. Fatigue, we know, impairs social activity, so this can be, again, one of these, one makes the other worse, and coping with fatigue can impact persons um, of all ethnic um, Caucasians. So next. And so non-pharmacological management's obviously a good healthy lifestyle. Stop smoking, we know that's important. Have a healthy diet, adequate sleep patterns, plan ahead, energy conservation, and taking naps. Move forward. Drinking plenty of liquids, staying cool, getting um, a personal fitness plan and sticking with that, relaxation exercises, and accepting help. Here are some of the pharmacological agents that we use for um, most commonly for MS fatigue. Um, some of these are actual stimulant medications. Others are um, older antidepressants that we know that have been effective. Again, this is something um, based off of your healthcare provider uh, you need to have a discussion with because these all have different risk um, and benefits. So move forward. So the key is communication is the most important thing. You must be able to identify your symptoms, communicate them with your healthcare provider. So keeping a diary, opening things up, making sure that you um, bring family members to appointments to help with communicating your symptoms and be open to a very holistic approach because it really takes a very comprehensive uh, plan to take care of most people's multiple sclerosis symptoms. Thank you for your attention. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining and staying with us. And, you know, I, just, I first off, I want to thank Trisha Pagnotta, right? It's very difficult these days to be working from home. You know, there's got this pandemic going on. Occasionally, somebody in the house turns on a TV that we're not ready for. Trisha, we hear a TV in the background. And um, oh. people have been commenting about this the whole time. So we could hear a male voice going on. And people thought it was me, but it wasn't me. So um, I just wanted to let you know that that's, you know, we've been hearing that the whole time. We tried sending a message, but that didn't work out. So meanwhile, though, I just want to thank you again for doing this. We do have a lot of questions. There are people asking online as well as, like I said, we have these all written out already. So with regard to cannabis, um, there's a person that's asking about medicinal mushrooms. I don't know anything about this. To me, that sounds like something really psychedelic, right? Or like LSD or something like that. But it's probably, it's, they say it's uh, like an example of it is called lion's mane. Um, can you tell everybody the benefits that this might have for healing? Um, I... <laughs> I would love to say I know everything about lion's mane, um, but there have not been clinical studies. I have had several of my patients that talk to me about this and tell me it helps with their pain. Uh, I, again, it's a complementary medicine that you can get over the counter. So it's not something I have prescribed and I don't have enough persons who have been reporting the benefit of this um, that I could really give a, a, a good opinion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, there are a few people, before I ask another question, there are a few people asking about the handouts. For you all, in, the, in that toolbar that's on the right side of the page, if you look down, there are different um, different things there, and one of them says handouts. So just click on handouts, and there's a PDF in there that says uh, 
virtual event journal. And that's where it's located, okay? All right, next, uh, some questions for you regarding uh, just things in general concerning symptom management. A person writes, my feet gets, my feet get feels cold all the time. I don't like wearing socks when going out, but I have to. And um, um, do you have any uh, selection of, of what I can use, any gel or lotion or another product that can help keep the foot warm or the feet warm? Really, I would say a neuropathic pain medication is probably going to be helpful to you. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Next, in your experience, I, has CBD, in your experience, has CBD oil helped your patients with any pain? Yes, I have had individuals who have used both the topical forms and the um, oral elixirs that, and they have been, they have reported significant improvement in pain and spasticity. Okay, thank you. Why do you give seizure, why do people get seizure medications for MS? Many seizure medications provide pain relief and uh, help with mood stabilization. So it's the pain relief most often we are using these medications for, but some persons who have some cognitive impairment, it will actually help with that too. Okay, thank you for that. Can you please talk about coping with and managing nerve pain that is constant and present all day long? So that again re requires a comprehensive view and that may actually need a pain management doctor where we need to get someone in who's maybe using long acting drugs that may last for um, days, maybe patches that are put on. So a pain management specialist would be um, advisable in that situation. Great, thank you for that. All right, next, um, how does a person deal with stress related to their multiple sclerosis? Well, my best bet is exercise. Exercise and meditation and um, giving up what you can't and do what you can. Great, thank you. Um, quickly to say that uh, people need to know that the handouts that are there are not for each presenter, okay? It's just a little bit about the entire program. Okay, and then if you wanna see more about each presenter again, you're gonna to have to come online when we get this published to our YouTube channel, okay? Thank you for that. All right, next. Um, so are there, what treatments, did you mention anything about the treatments for neuropathic pain? So I did, neuropathic pain medications, commonly Cymbalta, which is duloxetine, um, pregabalin, which is Lyrica Neurontin, which is gabapentin. Those are the, the main um, neuropathic pain medications. But again, there's a whole host of seizure medicines. Okay, thank you. Now, next question. Um, first of all, your answers are great, right? Do you know anything about neuro, um, uh, not that, uh, oh my God, I forgot the name for this. Uh, I'm going to skip this until I can remember this, all right? But it's holistic healing, basically, or or holistic treatments for nerve pain or any other type of pain. Do you have anything? Naturopathic, that's the word I was trying to think of. Naturopathic solutions. Okay, so there are lots of naturopathic solutions, and, and some of the biggest are um, uh, CB, CBT, um, which are medica meditation and um, a combination of looking at how your brain stimulates and trying to retrain your stimulus in looking at pain. So those working with a, a pain psychologist and um, physical therapists have been very beneficial in that regard. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, dealing with fatigue, what do you recommend for people to deal with their fatigue? I think you did mention about exercise, but what else could you suggest? Well, there, there are a multitude of things. And so exercise is extremely important. Persons need to exercise every day, but people need to eat right. People need to know that the brain is the biggest user of glucose and oxygen. And if they're not eating regularly and drinking regularly, that they're gonna suffer from fatigue just because their brain's having to look for food. So sometimes that's the biggest thing is getting people to do the same thing every single day, eat well, drink plenty exercise, mental activity. Great, thank and you for that. And what? And rest. 
That's right, rest. People need lots of rest. Okay, next we have a um, question. I'm never free of pain. Who do I see first? A PCP, a rheumatologist, an orthopedist, a uh, pain management doctor, or a neurologist, or an endocrinologist? What do you suggest? Well, most likely your pain generates from MS, and that's a central pain. So I would see your neurology team, and then they will refer you to pain management and or other therapies as needed. But the primary is going to come from your neurology team. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Next, uh, a neurologist tells me the tremors I have are due to MS. I've been diagnosed since 72. Another neurologist told me it's due to a central tremor. How can I find out what's, what's causing the tremors? It doesn't matter what's causing it. Whether it's MS causing it or essential tremors, they're, they're degenerative disease of the brain. They're treated the same way. Whether you have a lesion that's causing that from your MS or a degeneration in the circuits in your deep um, gray matter that's causing this, the treatment is the same. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have a um, person's hands are curling up. What can you tell them about that, please? That is spasticity, and you need to get medication to help with that and therapy. Okay, thank you for that. Next, um, we have, does EB virus cause MS and other autoimmune diseases? Excellent. So we know that EBV virus is the Epstein-Barr virus, which is mononucleosis, which is has been higher associated with MS, but is not a pure causative. So yes, more highly associated, but not everyone that gets mono gets MS. All right, thank you for that. Um, how do I find out about the lesions in my brain and what's affected? Your MRI is the best way to find out about the lesions of your brain and having MRIs done regularly with comparison is extremely important and that your um, neurology team will help you walk through where your MRI lesions are and what that could affect. Okay, thank you. All right, we have so many questions to go through. It's just hard to keep up with them all. Next one is firmly in secondary uh, progressive. Firmly, I guess, they're trying to say I'm secondary progressive. I am having difficulty losing an ability every day. I'm having difficulty losing an ability every day or it feels like it. Always had the can-do attitude. Now I have become I can't or I fall. How do I better, how can I better emotionally address this decline? I think a, it's important to get counseling in that situation. Um, physical therapy and occupational therapy, but you need some mental health counseling in there. Okay, thank you. All right, um, next question. Foot drop is getting worse and worse, yet the MRI is stable with no new lesions. Is my progressing, is my MS progressing or has the foot just stopped working and I don't exercise? As I don't exercise. Nerve conduction studies will help us determine whether or not that foot drop is coming from a compression of a perineal neuropathy or it's coming from your MS, and then treatment strategies can be appropriately uh, um, employed. Okay, thank you. All right, what cognitive what is cognitive therapy and who would provide it? Cognitive therapy is a way to help persons maximize the use of their current cognitive function and potentially um, improve their cognitive function. And this is done basically through um, speech therapy and um, psychologist. Okay, thank you. Next we have, how long do CIS, how long do CIS or follow-up relapse episodes typically last? CIS is a form of multiple sclerosis, and fortunately, disease-modifying therapies have, have um, moved out to persons can stay in CIS for up to 10 years um, in some studies. So it's a state, a state before you have your second relapse. The um, How does a person um, is a disease-modifying therapy? You need to be on a disease-modifying therapy to keep yourself from progressing. 
Okay, thank you. Next, typically when does progressive MS stop progressing? We know that our immune system become weaker as we age. And that's a question I don't have an answer for, but we know that as persons age, uh, their immune systems will be less able to attack them. And we are currently investigating that. Um, so there are persons at different points will report that their symptoms um, burn out or stop progressing, but it's different for every individual. Okay, thank you. All right, next question we have. I uh, want to understand the difference between a mild flare-up versus accepting new things happening as just progression. When should I be updating the MS clinic, clinic of what's happening as it lasts more than, it does last more than 24 hours? If it lasts more than 24 hours, you need to update your MS clinic. Anything new that's happening that lasts more than 24 hours need to be reported to your clinic. Okay, what happens, thank you for that. What happens um, when a person knows that their disease is progressing? They are physically getting worse and worse, yet the MRI doesn't show this. The MRI is not showing any additional lesions. The MRI is not showing worsening, but the person is getting worse. So, that is the description of progressive MS. But before we can say a person has moved into progressive MS, we have to make sure that, in fact, there's not other things like deconditioning, like depression, like sleep disorders, like other medical conditions that are not contributing to that person getting worse. So making sure that everything else is treated because uh, if there's another condition, heart failure, that's causing a person to become weak, then that's not MS. And you can't say a person has progressive MS if they have other conditions. So, again, work with your neurology team and um, your primary care to make sure that all your comor comorbidities are being evaluated and managed. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a question online. Um, Question is, what is spinal stenosis and what can be done to treat it? Spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal cord that is typically caused by degenerative joint disease. And so that is a, a neurological problem from degeneration of joints um, conservative management, and then you know potentially surgery might be indicated. Okay, thank you. So for the person that asked about the foot situation and cold feet, can you please reply again to um, what that was all about, your answer to that, please? So I have had persons that have said to me, the hand warmers and things that you can put in gloves uh, that they use in the, the North, you can put those in your shoes. Um, sometimes that's effective, but I have had persons tell me that some of the topical ointments that are used to heat um, the surface of the skin for persons that are having um, pains like um, Bengay and those type of things, persons have told me that that actually provides temporary relief for the cold sensation. Great, thank you for that. Do you know if there are any clinical trials that are specifically about symptom management? There are several. Go on to um, clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, thank you for that. Next, we have um, what is spinal stenosis and what can be done to treat it? Is, uh, did I just ask spinal stenosis? Really? Wow. Oh my gosh, see what happens? I told you not to ask the question if you've already asked it. <laughs> All right. Next um, person is asking, should I change my DMT if my MRI shows more lesions, but I have no symptoms? Excellent question. Your disease is still active. And so therefore, um, I look for my patients not to have active disease. So I that it, that's a consideration that you and your healthcare care provider should be talking about. But your disease is still active if your MRI is having lesions. OK, great. Thank you for that. Can you answer any questions about diet? I'm hoping you can, because we do have a few on here and I do want to address these. So I think you can. 
what are the best known supplements to aid those with MS? Okay, so we know that vitamin D is extremely important. Person should be um, maintaining a vitamin D level between 60 and 170 is what the consortium um, goal is. You should have a calcium rich diet because we know that um, osteoporosis and osteopenia, so calcium um, rich diets are extremely important. You want to have a very well-rounded diet and um, you want to get in lots of colors. So very good nourishment. Um, the Mediterranean diet is considered the most healthy diet. Um, and so all of the good oils and things in the Mediterranean diet are healthy. The key is starvation does not help. And um, these fasting, long, long fasting diets make it difficult for many persons. So if you're doing some type of intermittent fasting, it should not be more than 12 hours because that will make um, sometimes your symptoms worse. You don't need to supplement with general vitamins. Eat a good diet and then you don't need to take general vitamins. But if you wanted to take a vitamin outside of vitamin um, D, B12, strictly B12 is a good vitamin. That's very energizing for individuals and does not hurt your MS. Great, thank you. Um, do you know any specific diet that people should eat with multiple sclerosis? No, there's no studied proven diet that is treats multiple sclerosis. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us anything about the WALS protocol? or the Swank diet? Well, I, I read the Walls book and I've heard about the Swank diet and both of them have um, reported um, individuals who felt like they were better on those diets. So uh, they're very restrictive diets uh, and I, I can't tell you that they are what they claim to be. They will not cure MS, but they may make you feel better. So the issue is, if you're eating well and you feel better, is that the diet or is it, your, is it the fact that you're treating yourself well? I can tell you they're out there, but they're not proven to be effective. Great, thank you. Can you um, possibly tell everybody what foods they can eat that actually promote energy? So um, foods that promote energy are things like um, simple carbohydrates, um, um, leafy vegetables, proteins uh, are, are very good. Things that are not high in sugar. High sugar items actually are very fatiguing. And uh, so trying to maintain um, a low sugar, high protein and um, balance of carbohydrates that are from leafy greens and um, beans. Okay, thank you. All right, new question. They're all new questions, right? But um, if you have a neurologist that does not respond to your multiple reports of new symptoms, I think I already asked you this. Um, do you have advice? Is there a problem with the doctors? Oh, so the, pro the person is asking that there seems to be a problem with the doctors in the area where he or she lives and wants to know what to do about um, getting better advice. I mean, where can they go to? You know, I tell persons you need to advocate for yourself. If, if you're with a healthcare provider that you are not um, connecting with for whatever reason, then you need to find another one. Go through the um, MS specialty in your area, whether it's the MS Association or the MS Society or um, the United Kingdom has MS societies. Find a MS specialist in your area. Um, but feel free to write your specialist a letter telling them what's the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, I could add a lot to that, but I have my own things for doing that. I just like to yell at the doctor and tell them that they need to listen, all right, or speak to them. I mean, you need to make an appointment basically just to tell them that you're expecting to get more out of them and you're not. So something to say, something to think about. Next person is asking, I have not eaten properly since I was 18. I'm now 31. I do not have an appetite. I do not have fatigue, but I realize my cognitive, my cognition is my whatever. My cognitive is forgetful 
and uh, what steps are there in dealing with this and the doctor's not helping? Similar. Well, again, I think that you might want to ask the doctor to help you with um, some referrals to a nutritionist, to a psychologist. So again, you might be asking that doctor that um to treat everything and he needs to he or she needs to make referrals because you have problems that are much more than what any one provider can help you with so get your uh, provider to give you referrals to specialist okay great so thank you for that now we i just want to let you know that we only have a few questions remaining and then we are, we'll be going on to our next presenter but I do want to thank everything that has been asked by everybody and for um, for Tricia answering all this. Next person is asking if you can discuss anything about legumes or nightshades in diet. I don't know what that is, but maybe you do. Hopefully you do. Um, legumes are an excellent source of um, protein that is not animal based. Um, I'm not sure what nightshades are. I'm sorry. I Me neither. <laughs> I, I think it's a big tree that's just covering my driveway or something. Okay. All right. I think somebody said that it's like mushrooms and things like that. Uh, well, mushrooms are good vitamin D. Mushrooms are excellent sources of vitamin D. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Next. Um, so here's a good one. So a person asking what foods to eat to improve the immune system. But before you even answer that, I, um, I I have to let people know. I mean, there's so many people with MS just simply do not know that their immune system is hyperactive, not underactive. Can you just answer that? Like, just go forward with that? I mean, uh, you know, it's all through this pandemic. We're just hearing from people that are afraid that how quick they're going to catch something that they're really not, their body is not really, it's the opposite, right? Yeah, so again, you have, as I try to explain to peace, person, people in a very simple way is your immune system is your army and your army has plenty of soldiers. There is nothing wrong with the capacity or capability of your army. It's great. It's the world's best. It's your best. The problem is one of or some of the leaders have gotten confused and are actually, in addition to attacking things that they should be, they're going after your central nervous system. So the last thing you need to do is to help your army. Your army, it's there, it's good. We're trying everything we can to interface with your army to make it less able to attack you so don't do anything that is helping it because then you're fighting to give more to attack your central nervous system so again your immune system is great it's just a little confused and you don't need to help it have more players to be more confused great thank you for that answer that was very good i mean people do need that reminder knock them on the head a few times and tell them and for everybody that just heard that Educate those that are around you that have MS and let them know about this as well, because we just have been hearing the total opposite all through this pandemic. And it's very difficult to understand why people are not learning when they first get diagnosed what Trisha was just explaining. All right. So answers, more answers are coming in about nightshades. So people are letting me know eggplant, anything in the eggplant family, tomatoes, anything in the tomato family and things like that. So now you know, now I know, and I'm not going to remember though. So I'm sure this will come up again another time. All right, next uh, we have, people want to know, and again, this is great to know, vitamin C, why they should, probably should not be using vitamin C as a supplement. Vitamin C is an immune boosting agent. It, it helps your immune system be better. You don't need to take vitamin C. It's in it's readily available in, in any food. You're not going to have a problem getting vitamin C, so you don't need to take more. Right, but but primarily, I think. Um, it is and, and again, an immune booster. It's going right. to boost your immune system. Again, you don't need to boost your immune system. Right. Thank you for saying that. Because if you didn't say it, I was going to say it. 
But everybody needs to know I'm not a doctor. So you really shouldn't be listening to me anyway. You should be listening to Trisha. You should be listening to Dr. Boster later on. But I'm going to say it anyway. Do not boost your immune system. Do not take all those medications that they tell you to take for colds to boost your immune system. You have an overactive immune system. You don't want it. You, the reason you're taking these disease modifying therapies is to bring you back down to normal, not to boost it up. Right. Right. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you for agreeing with me. All right. So a person is asking about zinc. What can you tell us about zinc and why that should be used for MS? Again, zinc is a um, immune boosting medication. Some people think that zinc will protect them from getting the common cold and other upper respiratory um, infections. So they think they should take zinc so that they don't get a, an upper respiratory tract infection that could cause them to have a relapse. But again, it's only in persons that have a weak immune systems. You don't have a weak immune system. Leave zinc alone. Okay, thank you. All right, um, last thing. What can you tell us or what kind of supplements might there be for inflammation? So uh, that is a, a very, the type of inflammation that you can use a supplement for is not such that's going to get into your central nervous system. So you can take, you can be on um, gluten-free diets and whatnot that will move, help move inflammation out of joints and whatnot, but you can't take a dietary supplement that has, that we have been able to prove that will change the inflammation in your central nervous system. So spend your money on um, getting a good health care provider and getting a good disease modifying therapy. Great. Thank you for that. So I'm not going to ask any more questions. I just want to give you kudos and I want to let everybody know again, you know, this is a difficult time to be doing live programs on the internet. Okay. I mean, it's not a difficult time. It's unfortunate that we're having to do it this way, but it does benefit so many others that can see programs that may not have been able to get to a program. So they can watch it from their home, office, or wherever. So for those saying thank you to Trisha for her talk today, well, I wanna thank you for saying all that. So we're gonna sign off now from Trisha. Thank you for being here. Goodbye, Trisha. Adios.